Good morning, everyone. Today is January 19th, 2019, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. And you can find us at naturalphilosophy.org, where you can join us every new year membership. Uh, we can also be found on Facebook as well as YouTube. You can find all our videos, including previous recordings of this conference on YouTube. And if you'd like to help us out, uh, we invite you to join our base camp, which is at HQ at naturalphilosophy.org. And our rules of conduct in this uh, conference is to be respectful of all the participants. And please, no personal attacks. If you have a uh, camera, please uh, put it up only while you're talking. And uh, please try not to interrupt people while they're talking. And please keep your comments uh, relatively brief so that other people can get a chance to talk. Our, co our conference is coming June 26th to 29th at the University of Washington. I invite everyone to join. We will undoubtedly be also be uh, broadcasting conference live, so you can probably join it that way on the internet. We did that last year. And we have our special speaker, Dr. Gerald Pollack, He's a professor at the University of Washington. So today I thought, uh, since we had talking a great deal about the subject of like the electromagnetic wave, uh, Several of our last speakers have, have, have done that, that I thought we would uh, kind of just give a chance to uh, have people talk about what they thought about the speakers, whether and that's changed their mind about what light is in general. So I'm going to open it up uh, for questions about what do people think about the electromagnetic wave now that we've had these past couple of conferences? Uh, so I've got a few here. So last week we had Jeff Yi, and he was talking about uh, the nature of subatomic particles. So that's not necessarily has to do with light, but we can still talk about his ideas that there's a fundamental particle. I think he prefers to call that the neutrino and that electrons are built out of these things and everything else tends to be built out of those things. Uh, we had a uh, talk by Laura Gardy about the nature of light and she was explaining about the E equals Planck constant times frequency formula and a dimensional analysis. And uh, then I did a, a talk on a paper which basically postulated that uh, the electromagnetic wave is exactly like a sound wave and the problems that would be involved with that and how to solve those. And we had Ian Cohen. He had a paper about uh, whether light was an, an, an anomaly or whether there was an analogy to sound. And uh, before that, we had a series of uh, talks by Bill Lucas on the scientific method. So those are all a number of just recent topics we've had. Now, I've just recently um, reorganized the uh, videos that we have on um, YouTube here. So I reorganized them by putting the date and then the immediately the topic here so you can quickly see what the topic is on each of the videos here. <coughs> so I'm going to open it up for questions. What comments do people have about the uh, recent uh, science chats? Don't all jump up at once. So, Bob, you are saying something about what you think is important. Uh, 
Right. I was saying that uh, what I thought was important was mathematical consistency. I know uh, going over a lot of mathematics in this particular forum is not always uh, appreciated. Maybe I'm saying that a little bit too strongly. But I really think mathematical consistency of what you're talking about helps crystallize the ideas and helps crystallize um, the logic, the logical reasoning, and can help other people understand, of course, maybe not immediately, maybe they have to take it offline and think through the mathematics. But really, ideas are just, you know, a dime a dozen, everybody has ideas, but write it down mathematically and show that it's mathematically consistent throughout. Now I think you got something that really needs to be considered. So for me, it's mathematical consistency of the various models um, being discussed for um, for this particular topic, electromagnetic waves. Well, have you seen any such uh, mathematical consistency? Well, sure. There was Ian's presentation. I mean, all of the presentations had some aspect of uh, mathematics to it. But uh, that's what I focus on is the mathematical consistency of the ideas. Let's see, I have uh, people's papers here. So, certainly my paper doesn't have any math in it at all. I have some pictures, but zero math. And uh, I would say the reason for that is that uh, as a physicist, I probably take the kind of the opposite view in that um, we're talking about physical things. So pictures are probably the more convincing uh, aspect for someone like me rather than math. But this kind of goes into the philosophy of where math belongs. Let's see here, let's look at It's another paper, I think I'm just, you know, okay, here's, uh, here's Ian's paper here. Uh, Ian definitely has some math in his paper here. He defines, like, particularly the, uh, the relationships between the equations used to describe sound waves and equations used to describe, um, the electromagnetic wave. So all of these uh, square root things have to do with uh, the nature of the light here. Frankly, I, I think, for example, in your paper where you're, you know, using the um, diagrams and figures, etc. I think that's a good start to conceptualize what you're trying to say. And then I think the next step for me is, okay, how to express that mathematically so it's precise and the logic from one concept to another concept can be demonstrated logically, i.e. mathematically, and then all of that packaged together, can somebody else can take it and follow that logic um, or see if there's a contradiction in that logic. Uh, if it's just figures, for me, it's a great start, great concept, but then how can I show that all the various concepts hang together logically and consistently in a very precise way? And that's where I think the math really helps. I, I tend towards that, try to focus on that. Well, it would seem that the two major camps in the, the nature of the electromagnetic wave would tend to be those who believe that light is a particle photon, meaning it comes in very little tiny packets, and those who believe that uh, light is a wave phenomenon similar to sound. Now, my question to you is for those, I mean, can math help distinguish between those two 
possibilities? I would say yes, because um, the mathematics can help define more precisely what is meant by a photon. And in, in my thinking at the moment, um, electromagnetic waves are both. But I think there's two different regimes. If you know that a charge, <coughs> if you could just hang on to a charge in oscillate it up and down, for example, shake it up and down, um, that's generating the uh, longitudinal waves. But if that charge is in a quantum system, for example, an atom, and the electron is changing a quantum state, going from one excited state to another excited state, that seems to generate what's been called a photon. There is a distinct difference. The photon has a unique direction of propagation, whereas if you're just shaking a charge up and down, that's propagating in all directions. And that's why I keep making that distinction between, okay, if you want to talk photon, that's fine, but that's different than just oscillating a charge up and down, specifically because the photon has a specific direction and the waves from shaking this charged body um, does not have a specific direction of propagation. It propagates in all directions. Yeah, I just got well, to... Randlin, um, if I could just say a word about the <clears throat> uh, possibilities of using mathematical or more conceptual uh, m means. Um, I, I would say that they're really complementary um, I, I mean, what you had in the study of electromagnetism itself was, say, a non-mathematician such as Faraday uh, doing all the fundamental experiments and, and being very uh, good at visualizing them and, and uh, you know, projecting them to audiences and so on. And then you had a sort of theoreticians like Maxwell who built upon that and, uh, you know, built a complete theory. So... Uh, I, I personally probably have a bit of a bias to uh, quantization, but I mean, I think that has to be built upon uh, e experiment. And um, w I think with regard to the papers, maybe Bill's paper and my paper and your paper, um, I, I, I think <clears throat> we have some means of distinguishing between predictions uh, from experiment and then quantified and existing um, beliefs. Uh, for example, I, I mentioned this business of the um, reciprocity uh, or not of the Doppler effect. Um, I, I mean, uh, it's accepted to be non-reciprocal between observer and, and source for all forms of wave motion except light, except electromagnetic radiation. Whereas, you know, my thesis and perhaps Franklin's as well leading on from that would be no, uh, it, it, the same thing applies. So I proposed maybe some experiment that one can do to see whether that is true and whether the relativistic formula and, and the standard physics uh, are wrong or, or whether, um, uh, whether they're right and, and, and we're wrong. Um, j just a word, I'll be a bit sensitive maybe, but the, the latter two papers... Um, the paper by Laurie, actually, I, I didn't attend that, but I, I looked at it on the YouTube and last week's paper. Um, <laughs> I, it, you see, it's a bit hard to um, home in there. Like Laurie's paper, I mean, she introduced an in interesting concept about dimensional analysis. But, um, you know, with respect, I don't think it was very consequential. It was just, just really a way of looking at something. And um, with regard to uh, last week's paper, I mean, one can't really say that he didn't have mathematics in that. He referred to mathematics, which you can look at if you go into his website. But I think it was highly speculative. You know, it was not uh, very precise. Uh, so I, th I think maybe the three papers, if I may say so, uh, previous to that, uh, would lead one to uh, be able to uh, discriminate as to whether uh, we were making new predictions or not. So what part of uh, Jeff's presentation do you think was most speculative? Oh, goodness. I suppose most of it. <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, you know, he, he was deriving very interesting formulas and he was saying go back to his website and, uh, you know, uh, get the thing about e equals mc squared. And then, you know, I even asked him a question, were there any constants of proportionality in that? And he said, no, he doesn't use them. Um, so, I mean, he may be very correct. I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't think it was really heuristic. It was... It was um, and unfortunately, this is, um, if I may say so, a fault, I think, of many, many dissidents. We, we're, we're pretty voluble, um, <laughs> including myself, perhaps, but we, 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 we're, we're not slow, we're not shy. We put things on paper, we email, and we, we put things down. And um, it, it's all quite plausible, but, you know, we're, we're not uh, engaged in paucity. We, we, we don't really uh, apply the Occam's razor. And... Uh, all that we say is quite possible, but we, we don't really establish it. Um, I, I found it hard to, to find anything really in Jeff's paper uh, that, that, that I could latch on to, even though it was all plausible. It wasn't nonsense, but it, it, you know, there was no reason to believe any of it, really. I, I'm being quite cruel now, but that's, that's what I felt. <clears throat> Well, yeah. My question would be, why is there any reason to believe anything that mainstream says is plausible? Yes. Um, I think uh, let, I mean, let me just preface this by <laughs> saying this, okay? What I think dissidents do is they parrot what mainstream does, and if it kind of comes out seeming bizarre, as you said, I think that's a fault in mainstream because dissidents think they're doing science and they're copying mainstream. And if it comes out looking strange, then that tells me something's wrong with mainstream. And I think there is, but they don't want to admit to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I do understand what you're saying. And I, I basically agree. And I think I would add to, to what I, I, I said about, say, Jeff's paper or papers like that that the established um, theories uh, of mainstream, like we were talking about these uh, uh, last week, maybe dark matter and dark energy and relativity itself and Copenhagen interpretation, all these things, I would apply exactly the same uh, statements that I applied to, to Jeff's paper uh, to those. Highly speculative, just put down, uh, going on and on and on, not homing in on any specifics, might be right, but there's no reason to believe that there's any truth in, in any of them at all. Yeah, that's kind of... Um, is that, is that what I, what you were saying? Let me just go back. I'm sorry. I was going to make a comment on what Franklin said earlier okay, okay. and uh, about the nature of light. And um, I started looking into this, and years ago I was going to write a, a book on the history of light you know, I did one on magnetism, and um, you can go on the internet and get that. And I was going to look at light. And so I pulled out all my books. And essentially, to make a long story short, the uh, Newton proposed that uh, light is a stream of corpuscles. And um, um, Huygens said that light is a wave. And um, that was in the 17th century. Now, here we are in the 21st century or whatever it is. And basically, they haven't resolved that. So, um, you know, in how many hundred years since Newton and Huygens, there's been no resolution about what the nature of light is. So what does that tell us about mainstream science? Probably the, their mainstream science is still missing something, which makes that determination impossible. Now, I kind of get like your idea that dissidents may be latching on to wrong ideas in the mainstream. For, for me, one of those ideas perhaps might be the existence of the strong force, which might be completely a bunch of hooey. But yet we have a lot of dissidence theories, which do things like, you know, exactly predict the strong force or, you know, so, so basically you would be predicting something that just doesn't exist. And that would kind of throw your whole uh, theory as being suspicious. 
but that would be presuming that mainstream has that wrong, which they might not. So, but it is true that as dissidents, you know, we have to uh, use the mainstream as our source materials. So if they've got something seriously wrong with the source materials, then uh, we're just a victim of that. So Michael and Tesky, you have comment. Well, of course, I have my ether theory, and uh, just to throw that in as a possible, just another possibility to think about. Uh, in my theory, the uh, the ether is where all energy starts. It's a vibrational, uh, more more primitive uh, form of energy, and uh, quantum uh, energies were all derived from that. And what you have basically is the light way. Light starts as a a transmission in the ether. Uh, and but I think that, uh, along the, along the way, entrainments, uh, alignments, yeah, entrainments, we've heard and all of this before, Michael. But I think uh, my comment would be concerning, oh, say, like if that, you only look, let me go start. another minute, a minute or two, I would have been able to. We've well, but in, in uh, with all due respect, Michael, we we have heard that many times. So I think we're all familiar with how your ether theory works. Well, no, I was so I didn't want to waste time, time re-explaining the same thing. Well, I was going to make it a little different, if you'd let me. Well, I would like yeah, to get I, back to our yeah, point here. So Jeff starts out his theory in a similar manner. So he calls his uh, ether made out of granules, which for all, for all uh, intents and purposes, I'd say would probably be similar to what you start out with. Which well, is my, my ether units are, are are capable of of entraining, of uh, aligning and entraining and forming linkages, and larger units such as etheroidal units, and then up, up to photons. Of course, when we see light, it's uh, with our atomically uh, atomic scale uh, apparatus, and uh, so photonic uh, units are the uh, what's mediating what we see. I think that throws us off in, conceptually in that we, assume, we don't have to think about an ether underneath, uh, behind it all. And I, I believe that the ether is what's, where it starts, where the uh, transmission, uh, the whole transmission uh, setup begins is with an ether. And that what, what we observe on, on the quantum scale, on our atomic quantum level is... Uh, is uh, you know, it's important, but it's, it's not where it starts. But isn't the main problem the, uh, that the, pho the photons, that are, photons are generated all along the pathway of the ether, and then the photons do the uh, light uh, perception, but uh, the, the ether underneath is, is what's generating the photons. But I think the main problem is, is that your ether units are undetectable. There's no experiment that could ever reveal your ether unit, even theoretically. Well, there is. I mean, if you could generate an, a selectively etheric field, you could uh, produce a, a diminution of uh, density of materials within the test system. And uh, another word term for this would be levitation. If you could produce a, uh, an, even a that definitely wouldn't prove <clears throat> wouldn't prove the existence of your ether. Because well, that would be you. You would predict you would pre an indirect. You would, pre you would predict the demonstration. If you observed it, then it would be pretty good evidence. It might not be absolute proof. Well, there's a. In order to demonstrate the existence of something, like one thing that Bill Lucas brings up is that it's a pretty good demonstration if you can create a beam of these things, and then show that it does have different properties. Now, the kind of experiments you're talking about is still the kind of experiment that goes, if this particle exists, then if I do this other thing, then I'll get some other effect like levitation. Now, levitation, even if you do get the effect you're looking for, could be due to any number of different things. The experiment that you have to formulate has to, would have to specifically show that that is the only thing it could be caused by. Well, you would predict the levitation on the basis of having designed an experiment which is which you which you claim is uh, producing an etheric field. And if it does, then 
this would be the effect that you would be looking for. It's a prediction, and if you if you produce the same effect that you predict, it would be kind of strong evidence in favor of it of it being the, the cause of levitation. It would be some kind of evidence, certainly, but as to whether there's an etheric unit and what it's actually made out of, I mean, if it's, there's an etheric unit, it would be fundamentally different than anything else we have ever detected because people haven't found one yet in any particle experiment. And if there was, there would be, they would be all over the place, right? If your etheric units would be, it would probably be the most common particle in the universe. <clears throat> well, I've, gone, I've but, gone through my ether model before about how you had original, you had a, a, a universal oscillation which transitioned to a universal vibration and then those units are the ether and uh, everything came after that. The, these would be elemental universal units and uh, everything, uh, the building blocks of everything from then on, including quantum units. But that would be my same criticism of Jeff G, that he's got these uh, granules, you know, and he doesn't really describe them any more than that. But clearly they are the medium for the waves that he describes coming off of electrons. So that might be true, but it would be the burden of, of Jeff to show that these granules exist. And to me, that's building a castle in the air, right? Unless you have some, I mean, we don't even know what the, I, I suppose, at least in your theory, you have some characteristics for these fundamental unit particles, but uh, in Jeff's uh, in, uh, method, no, they're just a, a, a medium like uh, air. They're just particles that are elastic. Well, actually, I do have a, an experiment, uh, a experimental design, but I haven't been able to get anyone to do it. It'd be expensive to do. It would require penetrating Earth to a, a quite a depth and um, setting up uh, energy accumulating uh, uh, things that would that would accumulate etheric energy, which would be denser, more, more, more prominent deep down because uh, there's more matter down there, and eventually you would you could build up an etheric uh, energy, and then, well, anyway, I, ha I haven't been able to get anyone to uh, back back this financially, so I, I can't, all I can do is talk about it. So it's just uh, not really, you know, something I can prove right now. Well, right now I'm showing a page from uh, Jeff's website. So his He's saying that an electron particle is actually made out of, say, 10 neutrinos. So uh, an, a, a convincing experiment would be to show that you can do like some experiment where you break apart an electron and out come 10 neutrinos. So certainly that would be an example of something that might support this theory. Although, so far as I know, no such thing has ever really happened. I mean, I think and that, that may be well within our experimental capabilities currently, or maybe not, because neutrinos are exceedingly hard to catch. And uh, you would have to have a great large number of them to have even any chance of detecting them, even a less of a chance of saying that there's 10 neutrinos coming out for every electron that you manage to destroy. Once again, that's a really hard thing to prove, but I think it goes to the very basic questions about electromagnetic wave, which is, if it's a wave, then what's it waving in? So that's the thing that mainstream hasn't been able to find, but mainstream just basically presumes that there isn't one. And well. Franklin, here's my my thought on this, and that is that I think that we're kind of trapped in the historical context of of the going back to what Descartes and Huygens, and uh, I haven't got the full picture, but they're not the only ones. And in order to 
you know, Huygens in his book, really, I would sort of suggest people read what Huygens said in his book, because it really doesn't sound much different than what people say when they say, oh, I have an ether theory and here's my ether theory. And I'm thinking, well, Huygens said that 300 years ago. So what's new about that? Okay, I don't see anything new. And, um, you know, Huygens said that 300 years ago. And Descartes had another idea. So if you got a different, so you could debate, okay, did Descartes have it first? Or did Huygens have it first? Or did Hook have it first? You know, I mean, all, the, all people are doing is recycling these theories that have already been proposed. So, you know, I, I, I don't really see that there's any progress there. So, um, you know, it would be better if, you know, we understood why we don't believe what Hook or Huygens or Descartes said. Why are they wrong? Well, it turns out that, um, you know, it all depends on what the particular viewpoint of science is at a particular period of time. At our current period of time, you know, they're saying, well, there is no ether and, um, you know, light is a particle. And to a certain extent, saying that light is a particle is kind of an escape from the fact that they can't explain how a wave can exist when there's no ether. Since they said there's no ether, then they can't have a wave because the wave has nothing to wave in. So they say light is a particle. So really all we're doing is professing, you know, we're believing or mainstream is saying, okay, well, this is the way reality is because they can't answer the questions that really need to be answered. They, they don't really have an answer. I think that's the bottom line. And so we're going along saying, Oh, well, light has to be a wave, and so therefore there has to be an ether. But then you have the problem of, well, if there's an ether, what is it? And we can't say or prove what it is, and so we're back in this circle of going round and round and accomplishing nothing. So mainstream sort of has, has this rather clever solution where they say light is both a particle and a wave, and there's no contradiction in saying that. Yeah, that's double speak, isn't it? I think it's like a dog chasing the sun. Well, apparently head. mainstream doesn't see there's an issue there. They don't see a contradiction because they say there is no contradiction. Because they say there isn't a contradiction, therefore there isn't one. Yeah, I think that's scientific double speak. That's saying that the object I have is all black and all white. Well, okay, so here's my take on it. I'll give you my take on it. My take is that um, Huygens and Descartes and these guys back 300 years ago, they basically hypothesized that there's this thing called an ether. And once they said that, it sort of became a, a, a thing that people got fixated on and uh, were fixated on that there has to be an ether if light is a wave. And that's just something that was introduced into the thought process by people 300 years ago. So why are we trapped in 300-year-old thinking? Probably because, like you said, no one's been able to actually experimentally show what the ether is made out of or that it exists. I think all the thinking is the same, but it's all just talk. Really? Well, how can you have a wave if you don't have a medium for the wave? Yeah, that, I think as you pointed out, that's the problem is that there must be. A medium. Well, that's where our that's where our thought process has kind of gotten into trouble. But we're that's stuck because thesis. experimentalists haven't been able to propose uh, what that thing is, and uh, theories uh, like Michael's or Jeff's really don't give us much of a hint. How do you find Jeff's granules? How do you find Michael's ether units? It's a supposition required by the idea that you have a wave. Okay. 
And yeah, so you ha if you have a wave, you have to have something for the wave to wave in. And so that means you have to have an ether. And then science goes for 300 years and says, well, we can't find any ether. So therefore the ether doesn't exist. And they are presented with this problem of, well, we know light is a wave because we, we measure its properties and it acts like a wave. And, but we can't find an ether. So let's say that it's a particle and that means we don't need an ether anymore. But then they also find out that uh, particles aren't particles, that they're really waves. And so that really complicates the problem, you know, because all of their experiments that prove that particles are waves are based on the assumption that particles are particles and not waves. And so it's just a big you know, um, circle, circular reasoning and, you know, uh, assumptions that may or may not be true. Well, I think the one way around this is to just try and identify what would be a physical ether. Rather, I mean, there's two ways of doing it. You can either think that your ether is made out of some particle which hasn't been discovered yet. That's one way of doing it. Like Jeff Well, Spanier. let's go back to Huygens. Huygens, uh, in his book, um, uses the Newton's cradle. You familiar with this Newton's cradle? That's that thing where you have the ball suspended on, on strings, and you pull the ball out. And you, I guess I forget whether it's five or six balls, and you pull the ball out on the left, and it hits the balls that are at rest, and the ball at the far end moves out. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yes. I have one of those. Well, Huygens starts his whole theory on the basis of that there is an ether and it has inertia, okay, and it transmits waves sort of like this Newton's cradle does. And so once, once you start getting involved in this idea of, I need a physical model to explain how light works, then you have to have a kind of a physical ether. And okay, once you've assumed that there's a physical ether and you've said it's got inertia and it's made up of particles that have mass, now you have to prove that it exists, okay? Well, nobody's been able to prove that any such thing exists. So, you know, you're just create, you're postulating something that can't be proved to exist. So what's the point in doing that? Well, I think the first step would be to postulate the existence of an ether that is actually made out of things that you know about. Because the two possibilities are the ether is made out of some special particle that we haven't discovered yet. Call it like the uh, ether granule, or the only other possibility is that the ether is made out of some composite particle that we already know. So it's made out of things like electrons, protons, neutrons, muons, tau, what, whatever. It doesn't seem to be made out of anything that's material. So why are we trying to make an ether out of something that's material when Nobody's been able to do it for 300 years. I think that's just a waste of time. Well, I think it's worth considering that those are the only two possibilities. Well, well, uh, I I'm, not, I'm not sure you've exhausted all the possibilities. Uh, but, but I've been more concerned uh, with the properties of the ether. You know, we have a number of properties. And, um, you know, I, I've left it to others, maybe like, like Franklin and others, to, to uh, look at, at the... Uh, possibility of, of how it's made up but you see um ether has become a, a dirty word in, in mainstream because of its uh, ancient origins i mean it, it goes back even much further it goes like thousands of years i suppose to the ancient greeks and further <clears throat> maybe maybe in, into ancient india where they were talking about you know something that the whole earth the whole universe is filled with that it's it's more than another element um and really, this ancient concept was um, adopted by people like um, Descartes and Huygens, as, as you say. <clears throat> and then later on, uh, when, when we started um, 
measuring uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation effects, we say, well, uh, th they, they, they take place in the ether. So we use the same um, ancient uh, concept of, of this bearer of light. Now, um, if you start talking about a quantum foam vacuum or something like that, uh, you'll be listened to in, in uh, mainstream circles. But if, if you mention the word ether, you're, 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 you're liable to le lose your job. I think I told you about um, uh, a research student who told me some years ago that his professor had secretly told him, sworn to secrecy basically, but he didn't give any names, so I think he didn't uh, breach it, um, that he actually believed in an ether, but it was as much as his position was worth in the university to admit that to his peers. So th th that's the difficulty, uh, I, I think, facing us with, with the whole concept of the ether. I mean, Aristotle, for example, <coughs> conceives of the ether as a sort of um, something uh, inertial, which gave rise to uh, the slowing of objects. I mean, contrary to Newton's first law, he says that an object will go to absolute rest. If it's um, uh, imparted with an external force, that force will die out and it'll have to be imparted again continuously with a force to keep it moving. Well, he conceived of the ether as sort of like a, a frictional medium which is slowing the system down. It's sort of like an intuitive thing. Well, Aristotle basically objected to the concept of void and said that a void doesn't exist. But physics has adopted the idea that space is a void and so the universe consists mostly of void nothing and matter interspersed in a, within it. And, and I think that's where the problem lies. So, Michael, you have a comment? Well, uh, my, my, uh, my version of the ether unit uh, would be uh, counterintuitive uh, according to our, our, our logical perceptions, but the only uh, original uh, substrate that for a universal uh, universal ether would have been original space. So if original space had uh, had uh, had point localities which were oscillating, and uh, then uh, you had a yin yang combinational pair, and then th that would have had to necessarily re reversibly revert to singleton units that would have broken the perfect symmetry of the oscillation. But this would mean mean that the transition to a tra to a vibrational ether would would involve uh, massless units, and you would have empty space uh, to allow for enough room for the vibrations. But basically, the ether unit would not be be uh, substantive; it would be uh, massless. So that's like I say, counterintuitive. And but original space uh, theoretically may have been more self compatible and different from the space now. It had free of forces, and who knows what original space really was like. Sounds like that. Bill Lucas, you have a comment. Um, yes, um, there's a number of issues that you may not be addressing yet, I'm not sure. Uh, I just joined. But uh, the uh, uh, you've got the concept of in experiments, the electromagnetic field has tensile strength. And you've got the question is, can you have action at a distance or only local effects? In other words, uh, uh, if you have action at a distance, uh, what is conveying the force? And if you have uh, a, uh, uh, an ether, what is conveying the force in the ether? And uh, the, uh, uh, the experiments that have shown that the electric field has tensile strength. That means they can't be consisting of particles. The electric field is uh, a continuous uh, entity, and uh, it, uh, that's how it makes all uh, electric Electromagnetic forces, local forces, not the local contact forces, not uh, 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 action at a distance. So I'm not sure how the work, what you all are describing, describes uh, the difference between uh, action at a distance and uh, local contact forces. 
Well, I'm not sure that. Let's see, I got like a mute. I think we got an echo going on here. Let me address this issue. Uh, well, I would like to address the issue as to whether the existence of tensile strength means that you don't have particles, because I'm not sure that that's true, because if I had a, a long cylinder and I had a piston at one end and a piston on the other, if I pull the piston out on one end, it's going to immediately suck the other piston in, and that's an, that's an example of tensile strength, right? You've got these two pistons, and you put, pull one, shoves the other, pull the other one. So, and definitely know that the thing that's in the tube, which is air, is made out of particles. So I don't know that uh, the existence of tensile strength has any speaks to us as to whether it's particles or not. I think particles are quite if capable. If I separate the two by miles, I won't see any effect uh, if it's... Yeah, deep. you would. If you had a tube that was miles long, you pull one end, you know, it would suck in the other end miles away. Not very quickly, not the speed of light. Well, we would do it at the speed of sound, obviously. In, in but but we measure it at the speed of light. So it has to be something related to light. Well, I was arguing about not light, but the concept that tensile strength is a, is a property of, say, only solids. Now, certainly tensile strength is obviously a, a, a property of solids. If I had a solid bar and I pull it to the right, obviously the end is going to go to the right as well. And I'm just saying that you could have a thing made out of particles between those two points, like the tube and the plungers. And if you pull the plunger on the right, the plunger on the left, is going to also move in concert with that one, which is like another, yeah, I would say that's a demonstration of tensile strength. So I, I'm, I'm uh, saying that, yeah, you got tensile strength, but that doesn't show that the medium is solid, for, for example. The medium could still be this particulate thing that we haven't identified. But I think it's important to you know, go back to like Laurie's presentation, which is uh, she was just trying to describe what the nature of why E equals HF. Well, why is light quantized? Because this is the main reason why people think that that light is uh, could be the photon. But going back to what Bob said is that that light actually acts differently, has different regimes. There's the atomically generated light, which does come out in specific energy quanta, and it moves like a bullet, in that it moves in straight rays, versus, say, a sound wave being generated. I showed the, I, a, a picture, I had an email, showing that if you had a central vibrating you know object that that creates like a spherical wave from the center so if this was an emitter then it would come out in a sphere spherical pattern versus and that might be like a uh, like a radio antenna radio antennas would do that they would create the spherical kind of wave front versus atomic processes which create something more like a bullet, which heads only in one direction. It has specific size. But both of those things would still be waves. So I was wondering, did we have we have we kind of gotten maybe some consensus on at least where this origin of this photon versus wave things in some ways i could say they both exist they both exist as waves but some of the forms of light are more bullet like like photons uh, and light photons specifically visible light anything generated by atomic light is a photon anything generated by time varying electric currents is actually just a regular wave I don't think you can explain the speed of light with that uh, type of uh, ether. In other words, uh, how can light 
be moving so much faster than particles can move in an ether. Well, uh, Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was kind of the point of your paper that you were showing that, that like, for example, sound propagate based on uh, density and uh, elasticity and that those two properties are pretty much equivalent to uh, permittivity and permeability and that the equations look exactly the same. And so, and some people have done some sophisticated calculations about, you know, one of the more popular mediums is a positron electron C of some sort. And there's even several uh, notions on that. But uh, some people have shown that based on that presumption that you can come up with, say, the speed of light based on the electrodynamic uh, properties of the electron and the positron based on a certain distance apart. You can predict what the propagation speed for sound is through that medium, and it comes out to be the speed of light. So, but you're using, you're using the electric field to transmit the, the force and the, in, in that sort of thing. If you, you can't really have an electromagnetic field if you have an ether. No, that's not true. In, in, in other theories, the electromagnetic field, for example, my theory is actually just uh, another ordinary wave through that particle medium. At well, some your point, theory is trapped to 300 years ago with Descartes and Huygens and, and those guys who um, the rules in those days were that um, you had to explain things mechanically, okay, based on mechanical principles, okay, because you had the mechanical philosophy, which was the predominant mode of thinking that they that they used in that particular era of science. And um, it seems to me that if you're talking about an ether, we're still trapped in this uh, mechanical, we have to explain um, things, action at a distance, using some kind of ether, which is, you know, really basically 300-year-old thinking. I mean, I don't see why we need to have an ether, okay? That's that's just uh, based on a method of science that um, basically, you know, wasn't a very good method and didn't explain things very well. And... Um, that was realized a hundred years ago and they sort of tried to dispense with the ether. But the problem was they didn't have anything to really put in its place. And so we have this kind of ad hoc uh, MSM theory that doesn't make much sense. Well, I think what they're doing 300 years was the right thing to do. And that what we're doing right now, which is scientific doublespeak is is the wrong thing. Now, it's still a major problem for, you know, the 300-year-old theory. Well, uh, I get, you know, from my stuff. perception, if I was a mainstream physicist, I'd say, okay, you guys talking about an ether, that's like, that's like 300-year-old stuff that's been disproved years and years ago, and, and we won't, we don't even, you know, it's forbidden to talk about that because that isn't even considered good science anymore, so... You know, you can't, you're not allowed to discuss it or talk about it. And, um, you know, so that's kind of the current position because, you know, it's just not good science anymore. And so what's the point of, you know, rehashing bad science that's based on 300-year-old principles? Well, I don't know that it's bad science, but it's still the burden of proof to detect whatever ether particle you might propose. So that's the main problem. I don't think it's bad science. I think uh, most of bad science heard, is how mainstream dismisses thoughts that they disagree with and don't think are right. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. But yeah, well, I think it is. Okay. Um, I, I still don't see the need to introduce a an ether particle 
or anything like that. I don't see the point in that. I think it's, um, you know, just kind of, you know, old fashioned, you know, mechanical science that takes us back to Newton and Huygens and Descartes and it's 300 years old. And, you know, I mean, we progress since then, no such ether exists. And, um, you know, we don't need to explain modern physics on the basis of a me mechanical philosophy that's, you know, faded from, you know, being anything acceptable as far as science is concerned. I mean, it's 300-year-old, old-fashioned, archaic science. And I think we should go back to it. I think it's perfectly correct. But we do would have to find it. Now, with with certain dissidence theories, you know, there's no hope of finding that thing. There's no hope of finding uh, ether granules. There's no hope of finding ether units. That's because it doesn't uh, exist. Well, the what one way to make it exist? I mean, is, I, why would I want to fund an experiment? Okay, well, why would I, I want to fund an experiment when I know that I'm looking for something? I'm trying to prove something that can't be proved. It's that's pointless. This well, is just an old-fashioned idea. It's an old-fashioned theory. It's there's no evidence to support it. Why would I want to spend time? Why are we spending time talking about something? It's so completely out of date. Okay, well, if you would just give me a moment to speak without being interrupted, you know, there, there is still a large contingent of dissidents who are trying to find that physical ether. So this is like a C of some particle, like C of electrons, C of positrons, C of neutrons, C of neutrinos, C of something that we can possibly recognize. And the reason why we would do that is because there is some realistic expectation that you could find that. Or you could disprove that. For example, if we were to propose that space is a C of protons, you can, you can propose that. And then you could come up with some experiments to show whether that's true or not. Since we know what protons are made out of, and, but, you know, immediately we'd probably see problems that if there was a sea of protons, there'd be this massive positive charge everywhere, and we just don't see that. So we could rule that out. You know, same thing, there was uh, the idea that space is a sea of, of electrons, and that would kind of have the same problem. You'd have all this massive imbalanced charge. Or you could say that it was a sea of maybe just hydrogen. Maybe the electromagnetic medium is hydrogen. But then you would say that, well, I can take a space and remove all the hydrogen from it, and the light can still pass. So that would. My question here is I mean, you're rambling on, Franklin. The question in here is why isn't what Bill says acceptable? Because it does not actually provide, like you said, the 300 year old answer of the mechanical years, which I think more people can understand if we could come up with a mechanical universe, if we could identify the ether particle, then I think all the experiments would fall into place. So, so basically, this whole demand for an ether theory is really based on limited human understanding. No, I think it's based on logical human understanding, which is cause and effect. What we have is, if we want to believe in an ether or... Well, Bill explained it to you. Bill has explained it numerous times, and you just reject it every time he explains it because you don't want to accept it. But I don't really see that your objections are valid. So, you know, I don't understand why we're trapped in this old fashioned ether debate. Okay, we don't need an ether. Why don't because we just we're stuck here and and move the on? question of if light is a wave, then what is it waving in? That's a very important question. That's a valid question. And for anybody who wants to believe that, I mean, I, I don't think we have a lot of people, we don't have the counterbalance of the people who think that light is strictly a particle, for example. 
So we don't have anybody to particularly to argue about that. So it's not really fair to, but I think a lot of us still like to think that, yeah, light is a wave. And if it's a wave, there must be, a, there must be a media. Well, so, hold on, I, let me interrupt you right here. Yeah. There's more yeah, than just, just the issue of light is a wave. There's a, you know, there's more of an issue than the wave nature of light. There's the issue of how is gravity transmitted. There's the issue of how magnetism is, is transmitted. There's the issue of how electricity is trans, transmitted. Okay. So it's more than just light being a wave. Okay. Yes. And if you could come up with some structure for space that would support all of those things at once, then that would no, be really I don't good. know that we need a structure for space. See, that's where your thinking is gone off the rails. No, I think that's on the rails. That space well, that's okay. That's where the difference of structure. opinion is. You want space to have some kind of a structure, which implies space has to be composed of something. Okay. That's opposed that to space now. I got to put something into space, which is that. See, this is the problem with structureless space and that there's no way for anything to, from, to get from point A to point B without it physically just bumping into it. Well, that just looks to me like a conceptual difficulty on your part. No, it, that's that's a logical difficulty. No, it's not a logical difficulty. It's, it's a it's conceptual totally difficulty. A, it's totally a logical difficulty. Bell has explained, explained how it happens and he doesn't have to meet your requirement. So I don't see why Bill's theory isn't acceptable. Okay, I think it's acceptable. And because you have a conceptual difficulty, you say Bill's theory is wrong. So I, to me, I see this as being the whole issue here, which is, you know, we're just trapped in this circle of arguing, you know, ad infinitum and never resolving the problem. Well, that's why the only way to resolve this would be to find the ether is one way of doing it. For example, if university it's watches- It's never gonna be found because it doesn't exist. No, that's, that's that there's a hypothesis there. So if some university announced, yes, we found the ether, it's a positron electron C of some sort, and this is how we showed that it exists, then that would be one way of resolving this thing. Yeah, but that's not going to happen. Granule. Oh, it might happen. happen. It totally might happen. That's that's my uh, job. You're, you're pinning your <laughs> hopes on, uh, you know, I mean, that, to me, that's just, you know, pinning but your hopes on the impossible. Right? Because I'm not saying that the ether is made out of my etheroid particles or whatnot. I mean, that would just be a little green fairy. Me and the other dissidents who think that there is an ether, the best, the best candidate is still some sort of positron electron C. It's like some people will call it the epola, where it's a, some kind of solid crystal. Some people might say that it's a sea of, say, neutrinos. I think Jeff like bases a lot of his theory on the neutrino. We know neutrinos exist. But here again, that. it's not really something that you can prove whether it exists or not. So. Well, we've been able to prove the existence of neutrinos. We've been able to exist, prove the existence of protons, electrons, positrons, and various other short-lived particles. Well, <laughs> that's a red herring. I'm sorry. I'd like to hear Bill speak some more. We can, rather we can than definitely do that. Um, My point being that it is still the burden of proof for anyone who believes that light is some sort of wave to prove the existence of its medium. And what I'm saying is that if your medium is made out of, of recognized particles, like it could be made out of neutrinos or protons or electrons or neutrons, something that we know about, then that is something that has a chance of being experimentally found versus, you know, ether. But it's not been experimentally found. That's the problem. But it could be experimentally found. Well, that, that that's someone, just could be someone, doesn't cut it. Could, 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 possibly, yes. maybe. That, that, that's this, this is how science is done. People hypothesize. Science things. isn't based on meaninglessness. It's not based on things that could be. It's based on facts. Okay, there's no the only fact way you can find those facts. There being an ether. No particles ever can find those facts. At all. 
The only way you can find those facts is by doing new experiments that are based on experiments. those hypotheses. So. Or either that we're totally wrong and, you know, light is something completely else. But every experiment that we do, things which are very convincing or, you know, light uh, can it has wave interference. Particles just don't do that. Part of, uh, light goes through and does refraction. It bends through things of different refractive indexes and particles just don't do that. There are a number of phenomena that are all pointing to light being a sound, like a sound wave-like phenomenon. So there are lots of evidence, I think, that light is a wave phenomenon. I think we can explain some of the other photon-like properties still in a wave in a wave framework. I mean that's kind of speculative, but but still you still have to be able to find your medium. And if we did, then I think that would be acceptable to everybody. Well, the medium has already been found. <laughs> I agree, Bill. Like that's the field. point. <laughs> well, you're saying that's, that's the point. The medium's like already the there, no. and I, you know, and people are saying, "Oh, you know," I, I just think this a whole is a is a silly debate. I think you're right, Bill. It's, it's, so, so, sorry, just that. to clarify, what is the medium? Are you talking about a field? The field is the medium. The electric field. It exists separate from particles and it has tensile strength, and it has uh, infinite extent, as far as we can tell. Right. Well, I, I just wanted to say that I'm a little more pessimistic, maybe, that, than Franklin in this, because I think even if you did these experiments, which would seem, we might say, to an impartial uh, observer to indicate one thing or the other, I, I'm not sure if it would convince the scientific community, because I think it is really dependent upon their preconceived ideas as to whether they want to conceive of, of uh, a wave structure or they want to conceive of a particle, and they would reinterpret the evidence in terms of their preconceived hypotheses. Now, I know that's a fairly pessimistic um, uh, view to take with regard to um, empiricism, but, but I, I think there's a lot of uh, argue, uh, or reasons to think that that is what has happened up to now and probably will continue to happen. Yeah, you know, the, you're, you're right in, the, in a lot of ways. Uh, one is that if you want to believe in quantum mechanics, the universal wave function has to be more important than the than light. And uh, if you use light, you have to have a physical explanation for uh, things like uh, you know the uh, emission specter of atoms and uh, other things of that sort. But papers have been published. My son won the grand prize at the International Science Fair showing that uh, the uh, toroidal ring made of the field is what is an electron. And so the electron is a, a field entity. It's not the source of the field. It is merely a structure in the field. And uh, all the elementary particles are the same sort of thing. So the field is all there is from that point of view. But uh, uh, you have to you have to use logic to rule some of these things out, and the current scientific method does not use logic. So you, you can't disprove a theory based on logic. You could in the past, but uh, when once people like, uh, 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 oh, what's the Frenchman's name? I can't Poincaré. Poincaré. Once Poincaré gave his logical arguments through meta-theory, um, it caused a, a reaction in the scientific community, and they said, we don't want to be controlled by logic. Uh, we, we want to be free. And so they, uh, they took the role of logic out of the uh, uh, postmodern philosophy of science and also out of the uh, um, one before that, the existential philosophy of science. And so well, they replaced logic with self-consistency. Well, they also did with they 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 don't disprove anything based on false assumptions. Well, yeah. Well, 
yeah, that that's kind of that's that, how that's where self consistency comes in. If yeah. as long as what you say is consistent self-consistent so if your assumptions could be wrong but your conclusions are self-consistent with your wrong assumptions then your theory is true according to modern science yeah and that and and then logic says that's not sufficient so bill in your theory your basic premise is that the electromagnetic field is fundamental Mine is based on empirical laws, and that is what the empirical laws of electrodynamics say when you solve them all simultaneously using logic. And, uh, but people are not willing to do that today. So, for instance, there are six empirical laws, but only four were used, and some of the terms in those laws were discarded. And, uh, and that's, according to Isaac Newton, that's not the way to do science. Well, um, empirical laws are empirical laws. They're just, they just say that you have phenomenon A is related to phenomenon B. Those are, those are empirical laws. Yeah, they, and the they laws all don't the really experiment. say anything no. about what their, their causal mechanism is. But any theory that doesn't agree with those empirical laws is not in agreement with the experiment. Yes, I mean, that's true, but they're just limitations of empirical laws. Empirical laws are like a multiplication table. Given any two numbers, it'll throw out the third number, which is the, the, the result of the multiplication, but doesn't tell you anything about how multiplication works or what's fundamental. I mean, I suppose in uh, multiplication tables, you know, numbers would be basically fundamental, but that's not saying anything about what a number is. I mean, if you were a space alien looking at this you know you might not realize that the number six it actually means like six particles of something it just might just be looked like you're know, like a symbol or something and you might not understand you know what that really means and the empirical laws of physics the electrodynamic laws kind of act that same way that you have say this electric field and that produces this magnetic field and within the, the, the regime of the empirical law, the, uh, the actual field strength is a primitive. Certainly, I can agree with that. Well, as as all whether, that is required is self-consistency. As, as, as to whether, can I please talk? You talk too as much, to Frank. Well, let other I, people talk. Well, you're not letting me talk, OK? You just I'm keep the saying the same thing over and over. I'm trying to talk with Bill here. I'm trying to contradict this idea that the electric field can be considered fundamental. Now, I'm saying that within the regime of the empirical laws, that the, the fields do appear to be, you know, they're, they're fundamental uh, primitive of those empirical laws. But as to whether you can start an entire theory of physics, based on the assumption that that the uh, electrostatic field is fundamental meaning that it's not derived from anything that that is in fact the fundamental primitive of the universe i doubt that extremely because within space we have like an electric field like we have an electric field around a proton we have electric field around an electron now there's something different about those two Wait a minute, Franklin, time out. What makes, you, what makes you think that there's an electric field around an electron? I think that is such a very well established. What's well established about that? That we don't. You're saying in effect, basically, that. that there's something called an electron that's different from the electric field that surrounds it. Yes, How exactly. Do you, know that? you don't know that. You're just making up stuff based on things that you assume that may not be true. No, I think that's pretty proved. I mean, there are things which can be proven. For example, things like water. It's been proven that that's made out of hydrogen and oxygen. That's not an assumption. Those are proven, settled science. Things like the DNA helix. It's made out of these certain chemicals. That is settled. Those are not assumptions. 
it used to be an assumption. All right, well, time out, Franklin. You're but saying that what Paul is saying is wrong because your concept of what an electron is is not Bill's concept of what an electron is. And you're well, assist, assist, asserting that you're right because you're right. And Bill's wrong because you don't agree with it. I don't think that's really, you know, that's no, the way I, I, I see I'm this debating the, this idea that the electric field is fundamental. That is what I am debating. And I do not believe that the electric field... So you field reject it because you refuse to, first off, because you refuse to understand it because you, you claim... No, no, I, I reject it because there are better explanations. I don't, I don't, I don't really see how that follows. That the electric field is better explained as being hosted by a particulate medium. Ah, so you're saying that it has to be... So you're basically going back to the whole old mechanical mechanistic yes, I'm going back to the old 300 years ago. And because in order to explain in. the magnetic and electric field and their natures at the same time, you need to have a medium that can support both of those things. So in, in, in my conception of a, a dipole particle made out of, you know, positrons, electrons, the magnetic field is easily represented by dipoles. It's a very natural thing for that, for that to uh, be represented in, but still also serve as the medium for the uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic field. I mean, one problem you have to deal with is that you have a different kind of electromagnetic field coming out of an electron versus a proton. There's a positive field, there's a negative field. Physically, what's the difference? So if you say that the, that the electric field is fundamental, then basically you don't have to explain that difference. You just say, it just is. Uh, something comes out of the proton that's positive and something comes out of the well, negative. Well, you're rambling on, Franklin. Let somebody else talk here for a while. But it's an important point. You've got to be able to explain that. Those things are more easily explained in terms of a medium, and you've got to- like, In your opinion, they're more easily explained. Well, as opposed to there being no explanation. If it's fundamental, then there just is no explanation. It's just fundamental. Versus if you think that the electromagnetic field is possibly some kind of wave, and that's similar to what Jeff Yee, if you looked at, at, his, at his stuff says, I mean, I actually agree a lot with that, the only thing I disagree with is, is basically the origin of his electron as being this uh, standing wave internally. You know, we tried to ask him about if it's a standing wave, then, you know, what's the box that it's standing in? And basically, he really has no answer to that because it really can't be. There, there really is no box around the electron. So, I mean, there's something that his explanation for electron is, is not very satisfying, but that but that's your exactly. explanation of an electron isn't very satisfying, in my opinion. You're just saying that it's a hard ball of something. It that's just right. is that's because it is. That's not an explanation of anything. That's just your opinion. But we know that uh, experimentally, that is exactly what it appears to be. No, it appears to be a wave in experiment, so it can't be a hard ball. Well, that's up to interpretation. I mean, the, the, these experiments where they show that that electrons uh, create interference patterns. I mean, actually that was only theoretical only up to like 1972 when they actually managed to perform such a experiment. And in those cases, I believe that the, the quantization of space, when you get right down to the individual units of space means that a particle can't travel in every single direction that at some point it has to be guided by the, uh, the, the, by the matrix, like the, there's a graph paper and you cannot draw an arbitrary diagonal line of any angle through that graph paper. Well, so you're rambling you now. Follow some rules about how far you can follow those, those, those squares in the graph paper, then that is going to route electrons into beams. And so this is where I believe the interference patterns, so-called interference patterns, that you see from these electron experiments actually come from. That is a, it's a reaction from the, depending on the, the slot width and the edges of the slot. 
So I would predict you would get different uh, different uh, results depending on how thick the slot was, how wide the slot was, because it's it's reacting off the edges of the slot. We also have things like single slit interference, which shows that you don't even need to have two slits to have interference. That it, that it is in fact the edges that are creating the interference effect in, the, in, the, in those cases. You're rambling. No, I'm just, I'm just giving you points. You said, you know, what about the experiments that show well, that let's let other waves. people talk. There are waves, and I just um, explained why I thought that was. Could, could I just ask uh, something else? Um, uh, in uh, Jeff Yee's paper, he had uh, another uh, fundamental concept, I think, and I'm wondering what people think of it. Um, he, he talked about um, it being uh, quite possible to construct a periodic table analogous to, to that for elements, uh, for particles. And he, I, he talked about the neutrino as being like hydrogen, the most fundamental one. And because he had a few maybe little points, little gaps there filled in, he uh, conceived that you would be able to get, you know, a hundred and something el uh, elements uh, to map one to one to these particles. Now, that would seem, um, at a first sight, uh, in contradiction to maybe the concepts which, which some of us might put forward, or maybe Franklin has been putting forward with this positron electron, that, that the, there, there are uh, fewer particles than uh, might appear. And that the, uh, I personally um, have been wary of some of these um, experiments which have been done in, in more recent years where I think uh, they've sort of introduced ad hoc particles just to balance the uh, momenta on either side of an equation. So I'm a little concerned and I, I don't know if it was uh, uh, some, somebody said um, that, um, you know, pe people should be denied a Nobel Prize for um, or charged actually for introducing any new particle. But I'm wondering, uh, to me, this seemed a rather speculative um, hypothesis, and yet I, I must confess it's fascinating to, to think about. So I'm wondering what people think about that. I asked Jeff what K is, and I didn't really get a very satisfactory answer. So that's kind of my view of it. So, sorry, what's K? K oh, the, is the yeah, parameter that he was using to construct his periodic table. Yeah. Was analogous to atomic number, which was which had to do with the was to the fifth power, mm -hmm. which I didn't understand. So it's K raised to the fifth power, but then he linearizes uh, by um, taking the fifth fifth root. So the part, some, whatever, I didn't really understand that. So it all hinges upon what K is. So K was the mass of a neutrino. So I think that was pretty clear in his presentation. So K is the mass of the neutrino. And so I'm showing his uh, table of particles. You guys can all see that. This is table of particles. And it kind of looks like the periodic table, but it, probably is improper to do that but he's showing that the existing found particles can kind of be fit into this idea that the mass of a particle is due to the sum of its neutrinos so that's an interesting uh, concept and it's an interesting concept that you could possibly graph them and somehow they all show up a, in, in in a linear line, I, see, I don't think he's got that. He's got that there. So my that's, conclusion uh, is that K was not very well defined, and so I didn't really. And then he was plotting K to the fifth power, and it wasn't clear to me why it had to be to the fifth power. So. There well, that go. was just one of the interesting coincidental observations that say we've got the uh, number 28 here, the Mua electron. So 28 to the fifth power is the number of electron uh, neutrinos that it would take to make one of those things. Or like the tau electron at 50. So apparently 50 to the fifth power 
is uh, where you would uh, is is the number of muon electrons it would take to make a tau electron. Now I'm still not quite sure how these things really fit on that that graph. I'd have to go take a look at it again. But I think he was saying that if you were to just graph the K, which is 50, and the, the 28, that you would find that those fall on a linear line in his graph. Which is where the graph there. is K is the fifth power. Okay. Well, I mean, K, I think, was on the X axis, you know, one through 180. You understand what I'm saying, Franklin? Well, I'm just trying to explain what. I mean, if you didn't understand it the first time, because I thought I understood it. The K is the fifth power, okay? It's the exponent of the fifth power, okay? So it's K to the fifth. And what he did when he, when he made his chart was he linearized that by, instead of plotting it in K to the fifth power, he just did a log to the fifth power graph. Yes, he may have done that. Maybe that's how. It, that's if, what if he did. A, if it's a K okay, to the fifth and phenomenon. It wasn't clear to me what K is and why it's to the fifth power. Although my comment on this is that this gets to the, I suppose, an intuitive idea that the mass of something is the mass of its constituents. So that would seem to be a fairly intuitive idea. Although I personally think that that's probably not true. You have to actually describe this, describe what the nature of mass is, why something even has mass to be able to say that. So I'm, I'm not, uh, while this is interesting, I'm, I'm still not convinced that this tells me that like a tau neutron is made out of 50 raised to the fifth power particles. I mean, okay, so can I make a few comments here? Um, this all goes back to the uh, Greeks, okay, where Democritus, you know, that everybody thinks is a great guy, uh, Leucippus, and they said that uh, everything in the world is composed of particles moving in the void, okay? And so, Modern science rediscovered this, okay, around uh, towards the Renaissance. During the Renaissance, they uh, rediscovered this um, materialistic philosophy, and they said, oh, this is wonderful, this is great, and they all piled on, and that created what we call the scientific revolution and modern science. Okay. Problem is we're still trapped in looking for this fundamental particle. What's the fundamental particle? The monad, as Bill Lucas says, okay? And that all Jeff has done is proposed a new fundamental particle. Instead of it being the atom, okay, they said it was the atom. Well, we found out that atoms weren't fundamental, okay? They're, that we had three elementary particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then they found out those weren't actually elementary fundamental particles either. And so we got all these other particles. So what makes anybody think that there's a fundamental particle? Well, I think that was the entire title of his talk, which is the fundamental particle. Right. Well, he's claiming that there is, but all of science so far has been when they tried to find one, they found that they could, that it was composed of other parts. So every fundamental or elementary particle, atoms were composed of parts. The parts of atoms were composed of parts, you know, and then the parts of the parts of the atoms are composed of parts. So where is the fundamental atom? Well, in mainstream, they haven't been able to determine that an electron is made out of anything, or at least no one in the mainstream. Well, would say. Bill has explained to you numerous times that it's not true. And I think that, uh, yeah, I disagree with that. I don't think that the experimental evidence he has for that is uh, 
can be confirmed, I would have to say. Now, Bill, he might know a lot more things that, that are just suppressed, but so far as mainstream is concerned, that would probably be a statement that most people would agree with. Well, then that would imply that uh, they should build everything out of the electron since the electron is the fundamental particle, but I don't see that they've done that. Well, that's the way I would do it. <laughs> so apparently they don't believe that electron is a fundamental particle. No, I think they do think that. I mean, it, the electron gets its own little chart, its own little square in the uh, table of, uh, of uh, particles. And it's, no, you don't understand what, what like, I don't know. Like I mean, talking with you, Franklin, is you just you don't understand words. You you just reinterpret what's said according to what you think the word means. It, and that's what everybody it's does. Just, it's pointless to discuss this. OK, it's, well, it's my just point ridiculous. Being that if you're looking for a fundamental particle, electron is a pretty good candidate. But you're using the wrong definition of the word. Now, how am I using the definition wrong? That's very The simple. fundamental particle is the particle about out of which all of the other particles are built. And that's exactly what I mean. So why would you say that I'm not interpreting it correctly? Never mind. That's, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, yeah, everything Never is mind, made out of Franklin. electrons. Everything Never is made out of electrons. That's, how I, that's exactly how I see it. And electrons and positrons, I would call them exactly the same thing physically. But they do have, like, say, a different color or something that makes So, Bill, them. do you want to explain to him why an electron isn't fundamental again? Um, there's a number of uh, arguments that can be used here. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is scattering of uh, particles off of uh, nuclei. Uh, you discover that protons and uh, are consist of smaller particles, which we call quarks, and that quarks have a fractional charge. In other words, it's not plus or minus E, the charge of the electron, it's two-thirds and one-third of E. So therefore, the uh, scattering results show that <clears throat> The electron cannot be the fundamental particle because it has too big a charge. It is not small enough to be a fundamental charge. And so if you look at the charge of quarks, you know, uh, you see that they, they have uh, uh, <clears throat> plus or minus one third, two thirds uh, uh, E, the charge of the now, electron. If they could isolate a quark, I think that would be a more convincing argument but since they can't isolate a quark, and theoretically it can't even be done. Well, experimentally it is done. <laughs> and it has been well, done. Experimentally you can't isolate a quark. You can't, for example, create a beam of quarks. You just can't do that. Versus you can make a beam of electrons. And I think that being able to build a beam of something is the gold standard for the existence, the actual physical existence of a particle rather than what quarks were, which, you know, initially they were just a mathematical convenience. And I still think they're a mathematical convenience. So if you're basing the fundamental uh, existence of the electron based on the existence of quarks, which I don't think exists, then you can see why that wouldn't be a convincing argument to me that if I don't believe in quarks, then obviously anything you say about quarks is would be would be faulty since as you say that if the fundamental uh assumption is wrong then everything based on that assumption would also be wrong well a second so, argument is that if you do low energy electron scattering in other words when if you increase the energy the electron shrinks but if you do it at low energy you can see the structure in, in scattering experiments you can see the structure of the electron and it consists of three smaller components. So you've got these empirical form, uh, experiments that are done, and you're ignoring them. So you, well, I'm not familiar not with those bothered, ones. I mean, you, you could you, have them, but and if you do have them, these low these low energy uh, electron experiments, you know, I'd like to see a reference. 
Mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll try to send you one. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would tell you, I mean, me personally, I'm still trying to figure out what an electron is. Now, because because I'm I'm just stuck with you know saying the electron is a ball bearing pretty much. That's what mainstream science does, and since that's their assumption, then you do experiments based on that assumption, and if that assumption is false, then you know a lot of your experiments and your conclusions are false. So we can still assume that an electron is a ball bearing. It seems to work. Why? <laughs> There's lots of experiments out there that say that say that it's not like what? I, mean, I suppose in, in when people discuss these things, this is one of the main bones of contention as to you know. I think Mainstream would probably side with the people who say that. Electron isn't a little ball. That's you'll see that sentence like everywhere. Electron is not a little ball. And you'll, but as opposed to what I'm saying is that yeah, electron's a little ball. I'm not sure what's the ball of. Uh, so essentially, you've adopted the corpuscular philosophy of Isaac Newton, and um, which is 300 years or more old, and you're assert you're pretty much holding on to that for dear life. Because it's probably true. In your opinion. If something's true, it'll be true for 300 years, be true for 3,000 years, be true for 3 billion years, be true forever if it's true. The amount of time that it's been around is, is inconsequential. But that we haven't been able to, mainstream has not, you know, come to that same conclusion is because we haven't been able to find these things. You know, if you can't find it either, then it's okay. Well. well, they're trapped in a lot of assumptions that they've made and Especially that aren't really explicitly that stated. Then, then you'll never find it either because you're not looking for it. So you're just totally stuck then, right? Well, they were looking for it. Yeah, they were looking for it and they kind of gave up after Michelson Morley. So, but I think that should have kept on going. Well, I think you're trapped in this 300-year-old uh, corpuscular mechanistic philosophy that says everything has to be made out of little balls. Well, I have to agree with you. That's sort of uh, my stick. Other people are different. But if you're talking to me, then, yeah, that's kind of my general philosophy. I, I demonstrate everything on a billiard table. If you can't show it to me on a billiard table, then I'm not convinced. And that's just me. That's just kind of my limitations. But I think I can explain space as being, you know, this positron electron C, that I can explain electromagnetic waves going through that C. I can, in fact, explain the difference between a positive charge field and a negative charge field as being a phase difference in uh, waves. And I can explain, you know, Basically, what is the source? What what makes up? How does the electromagnetic field, which Bill considers fundamental, how is that actually built up? And how that same field can be used to represent things like the magnetic field. So a magnetic field would be a polarization of those dipoles. Or the gravity field, which is just a form of the electromagnetic field. So all of those things can be explained by the same structure in space. So yeah, that's that's a mechanistic uh, picture that would seem to work. The only problem is is that no one's found my ether, which is a big problem. I'll tell you that. That's a big problem. But if it's made out of positrons and electrons, then it should be findable. Someone just has to go look for it. Well, one question one might ask is, if there is such a thing as an ether that's a positron electron ether, then why are there different speeds of interaction? You mean different speeds of light? No. Why, are the, why do sound waves not move at the speed of light? 
why do other waves move at longitudinal waves? Why do they move at their speed? Why do transverse waves move at their speed? Why aren't they all the same? Well, we know that all light waves that we uh, recognize, those all travel at the same speeds. That's but not if you're talking about different. Longitudinal, longitudinal light waves do not have a, an upper limit that we know of. We can't measure it. Well, the existence of the what you're talking about, longitudinal waves, that even the existence of those things is kind of questionable. So every day, the way that I would answer that is that I would say that really the only waves that exist would be similar to ordinary sound waves, like the longitudinal waves that you're talking about that come off the radar systems that cause food to be preserved. I mean, I'll admit that that phenomenon exists, but whether that travels at a different speed or even what it is, I would say that that is more on a speculative level and that those things probably don't exist, but you know, it would still be my burden of proof to explain if it's not that, then what is it? But to a certain extent, as like Harry said, we're kind of stuck with what mainstream feeds us. So mainstream feeds us that all light waves travel at the same speed in similar mediums. So I don't know that that's that, that I, I mean, I wouldn't have to explain why different light waves travel at different speeds because I don't know that I've heard of that. Oh, they do. That's why you have the bending of light going through a, a prism. Well, you have that due to the refraction and we know that speed of light slows down in those materials and it's a mechanical property of waves that causes refraction. Right. That's pretty well understood. But, but why would uh, uh, why would we see that different velocity depending upon if I, if I measure the uh, speed of sound in the atmosphere and I go up higher and higher in the atmosphere, the speed of sound gets less and less. Yeah, and we understand that as being a density material problem. Well, so, why, why won't the uh, uh, ether uh, uh, have a role there? Well, I mean, we would totally expect that the speed of light is dependent upon the density of the particles that is traveling through. So if you're traveling through glass, there's obviously more particles there than say air. So we would totally predict that the speed of light would slow down. I mean, we have formulas depending on the permittivity and permeability of the material that exactly calculates what the speed of sound, I mean, what the speed of light is through those materials. Right, but so that, to, I agree with those definitions. There, there's nothing uh, that really doesn't say anything about whether there is a positron electron background ether. We would totally predict different speeds through different materials all the time. So see, no, but if you are looking at the speed of sound as they go up in the atmosphere, higher and higher, where there's less air molecules and going to be more dependence on the ether, that then the, the speed should go up. No, not necessarily, because uh, it turns out that the, the material matter that we have, like air, uh, actually doesn't make it, in certain sense, more, it, it, it actually takes more space than an ether particle. So it actually makes the ether less dense. So in some ways, you would expect kind of the opposite effects as far as uh, speed goes. But uh, that that would be one way of doing it. Although one would 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 expect that different mediums, different amounts of uh, you know inclusions, <clears throat> you know, regular atoms would be would be present. I mean that 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 would be true of virtually any medium, I think. But that's, of course, that's it's really not really merely good. density; it's the ratio of. Um, uh, pressure to density or elasticity to density, which basically determines the, the speed in the medium. So, for example, for, for a, a very dense medium, um, such as steel, uh, the, the speed of sound uh, increases. But that's because um, 
the elasticity, elasticity changes more proportionately to um, but there's a lot of open space in an atom and you can have all kinds of electrons in there and positrons what makes what excludes the electrons and positrons from permeating the the atom um, I don't think it does I think that an atom compared to what this positron electron C would be, would be, you know, gigantic, probably between the individual proton units, there's probably, you know, tens to hundreds of, of these ether units, because in order for protons and electrons to stick together, there has to be enough space to allow waves to occur. I mean, one of the mysteries of the proton is that it's held together by this so-called strong force or something, but the experiments show that while the proton is, you know, as a proton, the, the individual three things that are inside it are very, very loosely bound. This is, they, they call it asymptotic freedom that while there's this super strong force holding that proton together, there's almost nothing holding the three little things. It's almost like a balloon that has like three ping pong balls in it. That there's nothing, nothing holding those three things together, really. And I think that's kind of reflective of the fact that if you put two protons together and you get them right next to each other, such that there's no ether, there's no ether or any kind of transmissive medium between them, that there can be no force between them. That the force between two adjacent particles must go to zero. That the only way there can be a force is if there's space far enough away that uh, the, the peaks and the valleys of the waves that are being generated by these particles can interact. And one would predict that Say, if you had a, a positron and an electron, and if you put them right next to each other, the force would drop to zero. It wouldn't go in infinity. It would, in fact, drop to zero because there, there's no space for uh, an attractive force to develop in, in, in under those circumstances. But, but to try and answer your question as, as an etherist in my own theory, and I can only speak on my own theory, that uh, the ether is much denser than independent atoms. And it's actually required in order for the electromagnetic field to actually work. So they can't be next to each other. There has to be some separation. What is the electromagnetic field? The electromagnetic field, I have to define it precisely, which is the electromagnetic field is the thing that comes out of charged objects. If you have an electron, the electromagnetic field is a thing that we can measure outside of that electron, which say either attracts or repels other similarly or dissimilarly charged particle, okay? So that's what I define as the electromagnetic magnetic field specifically. And there could theoretically be a bit of space which doesn't have an electromagnetic field. So if you had a piece of space devoid of all charges, I would say that there is no electromagnetic field present in that space. And I think that would be in contrast to what you would say is that if you had a piece of space that had absolutely no charges in it, then you would still claim the electromagnetic field is there. But I would say no, electromagnetic field, it's possible to have space with no electromagnetic field. And I would say that the electromagnetic field itself is actually a wave. It's a high frequency wave of the highest possible frequency being emitted by the electron. And so that emits so out in a circle wave. What's up the wave? Hmm? What's the medium that makes up the electromagnetic wave? The medium is the positron electron C. You know, you can think of it as a C of neutrons or whatever, but it's just a neutral C that, that it's, that is waving. So you have the electron, it's, it's, you can think of it as just, a, I don't know, just bouncing around and it's, going back and forth and it's creating uh, this very high frequency wave that's propagating through this neutron C. And the neutron C, you know, technically is bigger than an electron. So I don't want you to get bent out of shape over that. 
And the neutron C is in fact made out of electrons. So it's not fundamental. It's just that the, 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 the neutron C isn't emitting these waves because they're being neutralized as being a positron electron pair. So it's just acting as a ball bearing. It doesn't interact with the electron at all other than to transmit uh, you know, the, for compression waves coming from its motion is how I would explain it. Hey, Bill, uh, Bob Gray here. I'm oh. wondering if in your um, idea of field, are, there, are you really talking about two different fields, one associated with electron, one associated with proton? So there's two fields and they're both have a tensile property. Is, is that the way you would explain that? No, no, there's one field, and the field can have um, solitons in it, which all fluids have. And so the field is like a fluid. And uh, a fluid, you have to have some continuity in it. And uh, the uh, uh, so in the case, the difference between an electron and a positron is the uh, way the uh, helical uh, structure of the soliton is, whether it's, a, let's say, a clockwise or anticlockwise in terms of its structure. And and so there, there if you follow the, uh, uh, the ancient... Uh, definition of the monad, there was a monad and an anti-monad that had to do with the direction of rotation. And uh, um, the, there's also some religious concepts involved here too, because um, in the Bible, the uh, source of the electromagnetic field throughout all the universe is supposed to be God. And it's this mechanism it can disturb the field and make matter, and he can uh, maintain the universe by controlling the fields. And you can do that throughout the whole universe because of the range of the electromagnetic field and of its tensile strength. And right, I'm not trying to... Tensile oh, strength is that that larger than a strong interaction and a weak interaction. And gravity. I'm trying to understand a winding around a toroidal shape, and then I'm moving away from that toroid to see that there's a field, and it's a plus field or a minus field, depending on the way that it was wrapped around the toroid. That's right. Yeah, I find that hard to understand myself. Well, now, what, let's, let's, let's just back up for a moment. If I make certain types of wave structures like solitons, which I can do in water and other fluids, um, I can see this uh, attraction and repulsion between the two types of uh, toroidal rings. Now, one no, going, I've never seen that demonstrated. This is the problem I have with that explanation, uh, that if you take two toroidal rings and they approach each other, they just rip each other apart, or was what happens. They don't repel each other, they don't attract each other, they just rip each other apart. This is what happens. No, no. If you look at the, the sample videos on YouTube, they don't work that way. And, and no, uh, I've looked at all the sample videos on YouTube, and that's exactly what they do. I've brought up several very good examples of what happens when you bring together both the blue toroid meets the red toroid ring, and they just rip each other apart. That's not the ones I see. But anyway, also Winston Bostic. Uh, he showed that uh, uh, made many experiments with toroidal range made of the field. Now, the other problem I have with that is that, you know, you can create smoke rings and all that other stuff and show whatever property you want, but that doesn't show anything that they, you're, you're not experimenting on electrons, right? If you're experimenting with plasmas or air or those aren't electrons. I mean, they're, they're completely unrelated experiments. Well, the and electrons are made of three of these. It's not really showing anything about electrons. I mean, if you're going to show me that, you have to actually be experimenting on electrons. Yeah, that's what I said. We do the low energy scattering experiments of electrons. You can see the three structures within them, one electron. 
Yeah, and I'd like to see those. Like I said, if you can send me a reference, um, I'd be interested in seeing what they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're getting towards the end of the conference here. But I did want to get back to Jeff's paper here. So he has this thing about waves. And he's showing, uh, you know, uh, that he's got some nice illustrations here. But his theory, you know, is similar to mine in that he thinks that the difference between the positive charge and negative charge is a matter of uh, phasing. So here he shows particle one, particle two, the combined particles, the wave cancels, and uh, thereby creating uh, areas of lower pressure. So I find it kind of difficult to see how a spin can create that kind of region, like the region between the particles is the is the line which which the force runs and if you think you think of two two balls which are pulsing and they're either pulsing in phase or out of phase if they're pulsing out of phase then the waves between those two objects are going to cancel uh, thereby creating a region of lower pressure therefore the higher pressure on the outside tends to push them together versus if you have uh waves particles of similar charge coming that that creates a combined constructive wave in regions of higher pressure. And I can see how that can travel a very large distance versus if you're relying on there being some kind of spin that acts to actually spin the medium itself, those kinds of forces are extremely limited because it takes a lot of energy to spin all of those particles around an orbit around your particle versus if you have just a compression wave, the, 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 the particles don't have to move a large distance. So if I put a speaker in a swimming pool, I can hear that speaker from like all the way 100 meters at the end of the pool easily. But if I put like a, a blender in one side of the pool, I'm pretty sure there's no way you would be able to detect the vortex of that blender all the way on the other side of the pool. It's just not going to happen. Now, this is the problem I have with uh, the electric field, the difference between the positive and negative charge being any kind related to any kind of actual material rotation, that those kind of things just are not long traveling versus compression waves, which we know are easily long traveling. So that's one aspect of electromagnetic field uh, that you have to account for in that it's very, very long traveling. So that's, that's one reason why I prefer it being a, a wave phenomenon, because then it would exactly match what we see in, in electromagnetic field that drops off over one over r squared, uh, just like a wave. And it uh, penetrates things just like a wave. And so Franklin, that's in the picture that you're showing, particle one, particle two, why does particle one and particle two have the same wave phase? Why can't the phase of particle two be anything? Well, that would have to come with the quantization of space. Anybody who wants to make this argument would have but to deal with why is it it can't be any phase. And it's, it's a space. time issue. Yes, it's a time and space issue. In order for this to work, both time and space have to be quantized. So but if, if, I, that, if, if I create a particle two, I can create a particle two at any time. And so... No, not if, not if time is quantized. If time is quantized, then you can only create it at the quantization interval. Only at the tick. So you can't create it at any arbitrary time. It's just like if you're in a computer and there's a clock and you're trying to move a bit from a zero to a one, you can't move that bit at any arbitrary time. It has to fall exactly on the clock tick. And for these kinds of theories to work, you would have to uh, swallow the presumption that time is quantized and space is quantized. So neither particles nor their motion can be arbitrary, that they always have to fall exactly at the same tick. 
So in this case, in this picture, why is particle one and particle two exactly in phase? Now, in, in Jeff's conception, I'm not sure if he has this picture here, but he shows the difference between the positron and electron and that the positron is just simply shifted one cycle to the left or something like that, which would put it out of phase with the electron. And you would have to accept this quantization. Well, I don't think that accepting the quantization is that hard a concept to accept because we have exactly that phenomenon in our computers. Like I said, uh, as an analogy, it's easy to think of a system which is run by a master clock where everything is absolutely quantized. So in this case, your particle or your wave would have to be either fully, always fully combined or fully canceled. There would be no such thing as any in-between phase. So I don't know if that's convincing, but that's how I would see it. So it, it can't be. There can be no out of phase. So I believe we've uh, come to the end of our, our talk here. I thank uh, everyone for contributing. And if you have a topic that you would like to explore in detail, you know, just send it to me. At this point, we are wide open for topics. And uh, as you can see today, I just kind of uh, did a retread of what we've been discussing before, before for, for lack of uh, a new topic. So if you've got something new, uh, let me know and uh, we'd be happy to talk about it. But uh, that will do it for this episode of Science Chat.